Hey everybody, welcome to Citizen by CNN. I'm Dana Bash and I'm here with three of my esteemed colleagues to talk about, you guessed it, the midterm elections. It's hard to believe that we're talking less than two months before election day where all of the House of Representatives, a third of the United States Senate governors races and legislatures all across the country are all up for grabs. So we wanna hear from you as we discuss these topics. If you want to submit a question, please submit in the box next to the right of the player. Um, if you don't know these very familiar faces, I'll just formally introduce you to Manu Raju, our chief congressional correspondent, uh, John King, who is the anchor of Inside Politics and also uh, chief national correspondent, and Daniel, Daniela Diaz, who is our congressional reporter. Hi, guys. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so, so much to discuss. I, I want to start with you, Manu, because, um, you, you walk the halls Well, they were gone for a month or so, uh, they meeting. I was still members walking the halls when they were gone. Man, <laughs> members of Congress <laughs> who, um, who are on the ballot, but you're walking the halls. They're back now. Yeah. What are you hearing there from them? And I'm, I know you were out in the field as well, but just start with what you're hearing then now that they're back. What's the mood among both Republicans and Democrats as we head into the election well, cycle? Well, it's tense. I mean, anytime you get this close to the midterms, both sides recognize that any single event could upend things, could change the dynamics of a, a race, could determine how uh, the control of Congress could come down. And of course, as we know, the Senate is still on a knife's edge. I mean, the Republicans recognize that there is an uphill climb to take back the Senate, no doubt about it. They have struggled in fundraising in some cases. Some of the candidates have underperformed on the campaign trail. There are a lot of rookie candidates in some key races. And the Democrats appear, uh, feel like they have a bit of an edge heading into the final stretch, but they are by no means overconfident about what will happen here. But uh, on the Senate side, the House is not back yet. And the House Republicans, they are still confident they will take back the majority in the House. The margins of, may not be as big as they once wanted, but once had hoped. But Undoubtedly, they are still favored, but Senate Republicans are concerned about their cash shortfall right now at the National Republican Senatorial Committee. Uh, the committee, of course, is central to uh, propping up incumbent senators, to spending money against Democrats and playing a big role down the stretch. They have burned through enormous amounts of cash, 95% or so of their cash in TV ads they've already run and a digital uh, fundraising operation that did not, that sort of went awry. As a result, there is concern that the committee may not play its traditional role in helping turn out voters through direct mail in the final weeks of the campaign. They're trying to figure out other ways to make up for that funding shortfall. And right now behind closed doors, Republican senators are meeting after news about problems with the fundraisers uh, have, have come to light. And after Rick Scott, the committee chairman, went after Mitch McConnell in an op-ed suggesting McConnell's concerns about candidate quality hurt Republican candidates and were almost treasonous. Now, Scott did not call out McConnell by name and deny that he was referring to McConnell, but it was widely interpreted as a shot at the GOP leader. So all those tensions are still playing out behind the scenes, behind closed doors, as Republicans recognize they have a hill to climb, they can get back in the majority, but it's not gonna be easy in the final two months here. John, you've covered a few midterm elections in your time. Yeah. And, you know, the hi history, if you look at history, except for after 9-11, the midterms after 9-11, uh, when Republicans held the, uh, the held Congress, even though there was a Republican in the White House, history shows us that the opposing party should do well, even take over at least one branch of the House. Uh, not one branch, one House either the Senate or the House, because there's a Democrat in the White House. Do you think that, do you, do you see any signs that this could be a year where history could be bucked based on anything that you're seeing? You do, in recent days for a number of reasons. Recent days, last few weeks, you could actually go back to the Dobbs decision when Dobbs replaced Roe v. Wade, the abortion rights decision on the Supreme Court, uh, reset the map and reset the dynamic. Now, uh, you know, it's cliche but true that eight and a half weeks is a long time. Uh, so let's wait and see what happens. Eight weeks is a long time until we get there. Uh, but uh, you do see some data points. Now, the 
at least one chamber has been lost every time in modern times, with the exception of 2002, which was the first election after the 9-11 attacks. And we lived in a very different America. We lived in a crisis America. But if you set that aside, George W. Bush, you know, I, the Clinton White House, they lost seats. We all remember the Obama shellacking. They lost 63 seats in his first midterm. Uh, Trump lost 40 uh, something seats in his first midterm. And because the margin is so close in the House, it is still the Republican expectation. Some Democrats think they can defy even this one, but I'm, I'm a bit skeptical. I would need to see more data. But you know, since it only takes a handful of seats to swing, uh, most Republicans still think they get the House. But the Senate, as Manu noted, is now 50-50. Do not forget these governor's races and these state legislative races anyway. They often get ignored in Washington because we work in Washington. They're always important anyway. They're hyper important this year because governors are going to have to deal with the abortion question. Does your governor sign or veto a bill for abortion restrictions? Does that governor, he or she, have a veto-proof majority in the legislature? The election questions we can talk about, perhaps contesting election results, that all falls to governors and legislators and secretary of state. So don't forget the state races. But I do think what is fascinating here, we can get into the numbers and the individual races, it's just how consequential this is. We will live in a very different Washington if Joe Biden, for the second half of his term, has a Republican Senate and a Republican House. That's one Washington we could have. Think of how different that Washington would be if we had a Democratic Senate, if the Democrats hold on, and even if Kevin McCarthy becomes Speaker or Republicans take the House, but with a very, very narrow majority. If that's what happens, Joe Biden has a lot more influence if he has a Democratic Senate. He has to compromise a ton he has to listen to Republicans a lot more if they control both chambers. But if you, if the Democrats can somehow hold on to the Senate and keep, even if there is a Republican majority, keep it narrow, then the Speaker of the House, presumably McCarthy, but maybe not certainly McCarthy, if that majority is narrow, uh, but the Republican leader in the House would be as worried about his or her right flank um, than Joe Biden if that majority is narrow. So the consequences here at every level are just enormous and the uncertainty I've been doing this for almost 40 years. I do not remember sitting eight weeks out, looking at a first midterm climate. The first one is usually the one where you have the big swing and having such a, so many questions and so many conflicting data points. No, it's so true. And so Daniela, I wanna bring in our, um, our viewer questions. And remember you, if you're watching and you have a question, please feel free to submit. This is from Brian in Pennsylvania. What are the implications for the next two years if the Republicans gain back control of either the House or the Senate. I mean, there are a lot of implications, but uh, I'm guessing as somebody who covers the House, well, you cover both, but particularly the House, um, having the gavels uh, on the Republican side will change the dynamic in a lot of ways, right? That's right, Dana. Now, I have not been doing this nearly 40 years like John, but uh, in my experience in covering uh, Congress these past couple of years, I was on uh, the presidential campaign in 2020. It would just be very, very tricky for the Biden administration to get any legislation through should uh, and what we predict the House be taken by Republicans. Uh, should Democrats keep the Senate? It's just as John said, it would be incredibly complicated it's, if uh, McCarthy becomes House Speaker. Uh, he could, of course, push his own legislative agenda, as we've seen as he's been giving. He gave a speech just last week, really nailing down these issues that we're going to see from House Republicans should they take back the majority. If uh, Democrats keep the Senate, they're going to push their own agenda with the Biden administration, which would be just a block on any legislation that we could see happening in the past, uh, next two years, should that happen, which is a prediction that a lot of people are making right now, Dana. Yeah, and this is another question from our viewers, Monica from Texas. Uh, Manu, I'll, I'll start with you. Do you think Clarence Thomas regrets overturning Roe versus Wade based on the fact that women are turning out in droves to vote the GOP out in Kansas, Alaska specifically? Additionally, do you think there will be ramifications for his wife's role and him being the single vote to overturn the election? I don't, I'm not sure about the second part, um, that's what that means. But the first part is obviously the key. And obviously it wasn't just Clarence Thomas who said that Roe versus Wade should be overturned. Uh, there were several more <laughs> justices, it was six to, six to three, right? So, um, yeah. you know, all of Trump's appointees and, uh, and then some said that this is, uh, that this should be overturned. So what are you hearing on that notion, it, it, 
Are you hearing sort of be careful what you wish for from some Republicans who worked for generations to see this day and now they're out there and now they have to campaign with this reality? Yeah, I, I, no doubt about it. And I don't think Clarence Thomas regrets this at all. In fact, his uh, dissent went even further in suggesting that other precedents could be overturned, such as same-sex marriage uh, being one of them. And that's one issue that is now animating uh, Congress. Now there is a big fight, uh, a big push uh, in the Senate to codify same-sex marriage rights uh, across the country and uh, interracial marriage uh, over concerns that perhaps uh, that the future courts could look at what Thomas said in his dissent and use that as precedent to rule against same-sex marriage and eventually get its way up to the Supreme Court. So uh, so undoubtedly his words had meaning and had a real impact on the political uh, dynamic, even though he wasn't in the majority on that part. Of course, he was in the majority in overturning Roe versus Wade, and that is a reality that Republicans uh, are dealing with right now. And <clears throat> it is a bit of a dog caught the car moment because they have been pushing for this for so long, but the messaging on the Republican side has sort of been all over the place. Some support a federal ban, some don't support any exceptions at all, some support exceptions for rape or incest, some are okay with a, a ban restrictions after 20 weeks, some want it in 15 weeks, others saying we should leave it up to the states. Uh, and what they don't want to do is talk about this issue in the midterms. Republicans want the debate to be about the economy, want the debate to be about inflation, about Biden's job performance generally, about Afghanistan, everything that the Biden administration has done wrong. When they're talking about abortion, Republicans will acknowledge that they are losing, even as they're trying to hash Democratic positions as being outside of the mainstream by not supporting restrictions, even in the third, third trimester, they are still having a difficult time staying united, messaging on this issue, even though they were on the winning side of this. So this will be, this is the big uncertainty as we head into the midterms. As John noted, there has been so much energy on the Democratic side and it had success in some of these House special elections. Will that translate into November? That's the big question here. Democrats see this as a winning issue. Republicans don't, which is why they want to change the subject. John, I'm going to put this next viewer question to you because you did a segment on your show today about on Inside Politics about Pennsylvania. And this question is from Denise from Pennsylvania. What are your thoughts on what's happening in Pennsylvania? It's always an interesting political state, but even more so this year. The Commonwealth, uh, let's give it its respect as a citizen, of the, as a child of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I'll always remember Pennsylvania as a Commonwealth as well, uh, but it's also a state and it's one of our most competitive look, just go back through the last couple of presidential elections uh, and look ahead to the next couple of presidential elections. This year, you have a race for governor that is absolutely essential, again, because of the stakes of the abortion debate, the election denial uh, debate, election integrity debate. Uh, you have a fascinating race for the United States Senate that is one of those opportunities, a Republican incumbent, Pat Toomey, who's retiring. And Democrats know their 50-50 math, as uh, Mato and Daniela know it better because they're up on Capitol Hill all the time and they see this 50-50 play out. The Democrats are worried, so maybe we're going to lose somewhere. So if we could pick up that Republican seat, sure, that helps us, right? It's a buffer, puts the, uh, puts the Republicans on their heels. They're just fascinating races. You have interesting candidates, um, unorthodox candidates, both in the Senate race, both in Lieutenant Governor Fetterman and Dr. Oz, unorthodox and interesting candidates, despite your perspective, in a state that, you know, Trump just barely wins it in 2016. Biden wins it by a little bit more, uh, but still a very competitive election in 2020. The thing, my biggest question, we could talk about the candidates, we can talk about the issues. Um, Pennsylvania is one of the places that in both 2018 and in 2020, we saw turnout go up. 2018 was a midterm that defied normal midterms. Turnout was high. So are we in a back to a traditional midterm setting because Trump's not in the White House? Everyone said in 2018, that was the Trump effect. Everybody voted because Trump polarizes people and gets them to vote. Is that true? Uh, Trump's not on the ballot, but he's back some. Will we see in Pennsylvania and the other battlegrounds unusually high midterm, first midterm turnout? What normally happens is the president's party drops off a little bit. The other party, the opposition, has the energy, and they, it's, you know, they come out because they're excited to kick, essentially, to kick the party in power. And that's why the party in power tends to lose. Because Pennsylvania is so close, and because the Dobbs issue has so changed the debate in the suburbs, if you go back to traditional elections, 
crime, immigration, inflation. Those are the issues the Republicans wanted to run on in the suburbs because they were punished in the suburbs because of Trump in 2018, punished again in the suburbs because of Trump in 2020. They thought they could win the suburbs in 2022 in places like Pennsylvania, where they are critical in close races because of those issues. But now suddenly, Dobbs, abortion rights, tolerance, democracy uh, back in play. That's the tug of war. Who wins the debate in the next eight weeks about what should be number one when you vote? What should be the defining issue? So I think there are a couple of states. Georgia's another one. Uh, Arizona's another one, we could say. But if you're looking at the laboratories of in a, in a truly purple state, uh, in a really wild and unpredictable midterm year, I could camp out in Pennsylvania every day till the end. Um, Daniela, this is a new question that just came in from Mark in New Jersey. Is there an urgency for the House's January 6th committee to conclude its work before the midterm elections? Well, even Jamie Raskin said this past weekend that he's expecting uh, the report to be released by the end of the year. He didn't even say possibly before the midterms. But if the Republicans take back the House, which is what ex is expected, Dana and uh, Mark from New Jersey, the problem is uh, that committee will cease to exist. They won't have the power that they have right now to subpoena, to investigate. Of course, Republicans have called it a, uh, a scam, a, a worthless investigation. They've called it out, including, uh, you know, possibly the future House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy. So that's why the clock is ticking for these members to finish this investigation. And also keep in mind that there are two Republicans on this committee who are not going to serve in Congress this next term. They, one retiring, uh, Adam Kinzinger, or another who lost her primary just two weeks ago, Liz Cheney. So that's why the clock is ticking for them to finish this investigation. Uh, of course, the plan was to have them have this report come out before the midterms. Uh, they wanted to be able to uh, in, uh, in, uh, educate voters on what happened following January 6th. You know, John just mentioned that issue of how democracy has been a uh, topic that voters are turning out to the polls for. Uh, so that is why the clock is ticking and why they're trying to get this through before November, but unclear right now, considering Jamie Raskin just said on Sunday uh, on one of the morning shows that I watched uh, that he thinks it'll come out by the end of the year, that major report that they've been working on since they started this investigation. Yeah. Yeah, it has to, but at least before Republicans take control. I mean, these the Republicans you talked about who are on the committee, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, uh, are going to be in office until the new Congress, which which doesn't happen until January. And, you know, you when you said Kinzinger and Cheney won't be here, um, it's so true. And we have to remember, both of them are not going to be in Congress because of Donald Trump in various ways, various dynamics played into it. Um, for Liz Cheney, it was the actual voters who threw her out, who, who chose Trump um, and his, frankly, his lies over Cheney. Manu, I want to ask you about um, Ohio. We talked to just a minute ago about Pennsylvania. You went to Ohio to do a story on the Senate race there, J.D. Vance and Tim Ryan. What did you find or not find? <laughs> I didn't find J.D. Vance on the campaign trail. I was uh, out there searching for him, and I did uh, try to uh, did reach out to his campaign, hoping uh, to see him in action. Uh, he was not doing any public campaigning. He said that his campaign said he was only having private events, and that has been in keeping with the way he has conducted his campaign since winning his primary. I mean, recall he is a first-time candidate. He is uh, the former author of the book *Hillbilly LG and a former venture capitalist, uh, someone who ran the campaign in a crowded primary and really seemed like he was on the outs until Donald Trump came behind and supported him in that crowded primary. And suddenly he emerged victorious behind that and the backing of Peter Thiel, the uh, uh, big Republican donor who dropped about 15 million or so into a super PAC to boost Vance. But when Vance emerged, he really didn't have much of an infrastructure. He didn't have much of a campaign uh, staff, didn't really have a big donor network and had to work on repairing bridges. And it took him some time to find his footing. He didn't, uh, he is, and he struggled fundraising. His last fundraising report showed him in mm. debt and also showed him raising just a fraction of money as his Democratic opponent, Tim Ryan, who's been pouring tons and tons of money across the airwaves to try to burnish an image of a moderate, independent person. He doesn't mention he's a Democrat in this increasingly conservative state. In some ways, he sounds like a Republican. He says, I voted for the Trump trade policies. 
I voted against uh, Barack Obama trade policies and, and talking to some voters and some other strategists. He, he looking at his ads, they're effective because he comes across as someone who does not is not part of what is a uh, unpopular Democratic brand in his state. And I asked him, Ryan, about why he doesn't advertise as a Democrat. He said, well, it is not uh, in say it's not a, the brand is not good in some parts of the state. And of course, it's a largely rural state. So um, the campaign, uh, while Vance has not been on the trail as much, he's expected to show his face more in public in uh, post Labor Day. And he's also benefiting greatly from $28 million that Mitch McConnell's super PAC plans to pour across the airways in the final two months of the campaign. That is a ton of money that initially Republicans thought would be spent elsewhere, not on what they had thought was a safe seat and a lock. And that could have an impact across the map as they weigh resource decisions in the final weeks on where to spend their money in these key races. So Republicans believe they will win Ohio because of this late money coming in from Mitch McConnell's super back. But let's see what kind of impact it could have in some other races as they make those key decisions late about whether to spend money to, say, try to win Colorado, for instance, or perhaps put more money into Wisconsin. Those are big decisions. Those money decisions, and they make a big difference. Yeah, and if you want to know where the party thinks uh, the trajectory of a particular race is going, that's you just have to follow the money to see where big super PACs like Mitch McConnell's are spending their money and how much, and same with the, with the Democrats as well. I was in Michigan last week, also had a lot of trouble. In fact, I was unsuccessful at uh, talking to the Republican candidate for governor there, Tudor Dixon. They just said flat no. She had no public events, no interview. They wouldn't provide a surrogate, nothing. So I think in her case, she's spending a lot of time raising money. Um, but it's a really interesting trend that we're seeing among Republicans. I guess they just think that they can spend money when people are paying attention closer to the election to define themselves. It's just a question of whether they are already being defined as we speak by their Democratic opponents. Um, yeah. John, this is, this is for you. Uh, Jonathan from New York. Since Trump turned the political system upside down, is there anything normal to rely on in our governing governing bodies? Uh, well, there are a number of ways you could come at that one. Uh, look, Trump was uh, completely unorthodox, right? Uh, remember all the people who said he had no way he could win the Republican nomination, and then he plowed through a very experienced field of politicians, and he did. Everyone said he couldn't win the presidency. He, uh, he did. Um, and uh, so how government worked, uh, this whole controversy now investigation of the sensitive documents, classified documents taken to Mar-a-Lago. You can come at this a um, hundred different ways, if not a thousand different ways of how uh, Trump either put some previous issues like polarization. Polarization existed before Trump. Uh, he put it on steroids. Uh, the Republican focus on issues like immigration existed before Trump. He put it on steroids. Other norms are more Trumpian, if you will, specific to Trump. In the context of what we're about to go through, I think it connects to the conversation you were just having. Uh, last night in my home state, Massachusetts, uh, a Trump guy uh, won the Republican nomination for governor. Uh, most smart Republicans now think that guarantees a Democratic governor in Massachusetts. Massachusetts has a history, uh, Bill Weld, Paul Salucci, the current governor, Charlie Baker, of sometimes electing a moderate Republican governor as a check on the majority Democrats in Massachusetts. Americans tend to like divided, balanced government. Uh, the, the governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan, uh, can't run for re-election. His choice to replace him, beaten by a, a Trump nominee. In Pennsylvania, we talked about earlier, the Trump nominee beating more mainstream Republicans, even a pretty conservative Republican and former Congressman Lou Barletta, but a couple of other guys from the business community who did well where? Only in the suburbs around Philadelphia where Republicans need to win. So I do think we are having a Trump effect in this race. And I think in part, a lot of Republicans are now, if we were having this conversation six months ago, even three months ago, uh, the conversation would be the race that matters for Republicans is the primary. Because if J.D. Vance can win that nomination, he's the next senator from Ohio. You know, If Tudor Dixon can win that nomination, she's probably the next governor for Michigan because people saw a red wave building or at least a certain big red year building. We live in a different world now. And in that different world, I would argue experience can matter. In the hand-to-hand -hand combat of a 50-50 election in these key battleground states, 
the fact that J.D. Vance, for Republicans, I get it. He's unorthodox. A lot of people, Democrats and Republicans sometimes look for people outside the system, like Donald Trump, because they're frustrated. They're disaffected. They don't think the politicians listen to them. I get that completely. And I respect voters when they're looking for something different. But in the hand-to-hand combat in the final days of a close campaign, often the best politician wins. Uh, and sometimes that politician is a guy, maybe it's, I'm not saying Tim Ryan's going to win in Ohio, but that race is close because there's a guy who knows, where can I talk like a Democrat? Where can I embrace the unions, for example? Where And you can both embrace the unions and the Trump trade policy, right? Mm-hmm. That, that might not sound like it makes sense, but you do that. So knowing your state, uh, Governor Whitmer has won before. A lot of people watching this who might not like Governor Whitmer for whatever reason. Maybe they're just Republicans. Maybe they're Democrats who didn't like the COVID policies, but she's done it before. That's my point, that we live in a very different climate now where it's not a full wind at the back of these Republicans. So I think when we go through these races, the Trump effect could be that they can't match him. He was an unorthodox guy with no political experience who managed to win the presidency, which again, whatever you think of Donald Trump is a wow. That, that is hard to do. It's a wow. Um, can these other candidates match that? Do they have the, are they so unorthodox that they can tap into their states or does the more experienced politician beat them in the end? Because when it's close, often that matters. Yeah, no, it does. And it, it's important to differentiate between what you're alluding to here, statewide races and le- right. blue leaning or purple, or maybe even uh, Republican uh, states like Ohio um for governor and senate and then the house races so daniela when you're talking about the trump factor that both uh, manu and john were alluding to it plays out quite differently in the house races because of uh, of gerrymandering and so many of these of these districts are hardcore red or hardcore blue there's so few swing districts that would play out the way the statewide races are playing. So so Republicans in the House sort of treat and look at Trump in a different, more welcoming way, right? Exactly. I mean, they've been successful in embracing Trump the way they have. That's why you've seen more moderate uh, people in leadership, Republicans in leadership go shift toward Trump. If you remember, Elise Stefanik used to be a more moderate member in Congress. She was actually more moderate uh, than even uh, Liz Cheney and her voting record before she became the GOP conference chair. Obviously, it suited her to move to, be, to more conservative, uh, embrace Trump. We've seen even Kevin McCarthy in the last few years really embrace Trump, as many people say, kiss the ring. Uh, and, and that's how he's been able to win over members of the House Freedom Caucus, the more conservative members of his party, keep people like Marjorie Taylor Greene on his side, people he's going to need, Dana, when he runs for speaker, when the House wins uh uh, excuse me, when Republicans win the House. Now, another factor in all of this that we haven't even mentioned is that when Republicans take over, they're going to start mm-hmm. investigations on the Biden right. administration. They're going to possibly try to impeach President Joe Biden. This is all going to be part of what we're going to see these next two years uh, when Republicans take back the House. And that is why, of course, uh, these Republicans, we're still seeing that there should have a small margin. You know, Manu had a really good story with our colleague Melanie Zinn about how Republicans are seeing that there's going to be a smaller margin, possibly not as large of a margin, considering all these wins that the Biden administration has had in legislation the past couple of weeks, including the Inflation Reduction Act. But uh, they're still likely going to take the majority uh, have a small margin, and we're going to see their power in these committees, like most likely the House Oversight Committee, uh, when they take over and what they're going to do against the Biden administration, against Democrats, uh, and, and enforce that power to investigate, you know, the political Bibles that they have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, Thomas, uh, Danielle, just staying with you quickly, Thomas from Hawaii asks the very question uh, that you just brought up, which is uh, Republicans thinking about impeaching Joe Biden already if they have the gavel and and the ability to investigate. His question though is, are there any Republicans worried about overreaching an appeal to their base if they take back the majority in the House? Well, if uh, you wanna count the 10 Republicans that impeached Donald Trump uh, to last year, last January, only two right now are possibly coming back uh, to Congress so that really shows where things stand right now with House Republicans and, uh, you know, how, what they feel about Trump, what they feel about uh, Joe Biden. And, uh, you know, they've already hinted multiple times, made comments toward 
In fact, you know, I made this earlier and before the speech last week that they're planning to investigate Joe Biden, and that's really where the party's headed. And they, uh, if there are any moderates that do not believe that that's the way the party should go, it's likely that they won't have the support from the majority of the party. And that is what, you know, these Republicans that are going to be in these powerful committees have hinted. For example, James Comer, who's probably going to be the chairman of the House Oversight Committee, plans to investigate Hunter Biden. So that is going to be what we're going to see when re Republicans take back the House. And there's really no stopping them should they continue with the momentum that they have now. Yeah, only five can seats. I, Go ahead, Manu. Can I just add, again, I mean, that is always the risk of a majority, you know, is overreaching. I mean, you see it time and time again. They come in with a head of steam. It could be on the Republican side, or the Democratic side. They have a huge agenda. Oftentimes they misread their mandate. They go beyond what voters elected them for. And it could have some impact, actually could potentially help Joe Biden in some ways, assuming Joe Biden runs for re-election and he has a foil to run against the Republican House. In fact, if it comes to that, I mean, Obama did the same thing after losing the House in 2010. He ran against the House Republicans in 2012 use that uh, as a successful strategy, you know, the challenge for the Republicans is going to be, in addition to these investigations that they'll undoubtedly launch, the pressure that McCarthy would, would face, assuming he's speaker, to impeach, is actually getting the basic functioning of government done. They still will have to fund the government. They mm -hmm. will have to raise the national debt ceiling early in the new Congress. That to avoid what could be the first ever debt default in the United States. That is going to be an incredibly tricky issue because no Republican wants to vote for that. But ultimately, some votes will have to come from the GOP side. Democrats won't want to vote for that either. They may try to attach things to it. It's going to be a huge, huge mess. So that is one big reason why. McCarthy's uh, super PAC has spent so much money to try to build what they call a, quote, governing majority, which gives mm -hmm. them some cushion on the Republican side, not a single digit majority, which would allow that right flank to really control what McCarthy does. But for him to ignore that right flank and do something with more people in line with his viewpoint, his ideology, whether they get that is another question. But it is uh, a recipe for what could be a pretty messy yeah. couple of years if that plays out. Such it's such an important point. I mean, we all covered uh, Speaker Boehner had a giant majority, but it had a very tough time governing because they were all over the place. At that point, it was the Freedom Caucus. They were upset about spending and it was pre-Trump. Uh, and then uh, Paul Ryan more recently just kind of had well, lots of troubles, but the main trouble, main challenge he had was being a traditional Republican in the age of Trump. Um, and the question is, John, whether or not, I mean, this, this is an unanswerable question, but whether or not if you just look at the battleground districts at the battlefield, the political battlefield, whether or not McCarthy or whomever is speaker, if the Republicans take over, even have the option for something that is really big in order to be able to govern. Because again, there are so few swing states and a lot of swing districts rather, and a lot of those that existed, Republicans already won in 2020. Right. Yeah, the, the availability of the map, barring a giant wave is much smaller. You know, as I said, Obama lost 63, Trump lost 42 or 43. Uh, you can't do that anymore because of the redistricting. I mean, it's possible if you have a giant, giant wave, but just set that out of your mind. But again, if you go back uh, three, four, five, six months, people were thinking the Republicans could get 20 plus, uh, maybe 30 seats. Uh, and that would give Kevin McCarthy that wiggle room. That would give him the ability you know, to ignore uh, some of the agitators sometimes or to give people a pass on tough votes like the debt ceiling, on tough votes like other things, saying, I don't need your vote. I understand you can't sell this back home. Great. You can vote no because I got enough votes over here. Um, you, would think, you would think that Democrats would be thrilled, and they will be thrilled. Uh, assume, Democrats want to keep the House. If they don't, uh, they, of course, want Kevin McCarthy to have or the Republicans to have the smallest possible majority. However, that will make Joe Biden's job even more difficult uh, because that because the Republican leader will be getting flack from the right all the time. And the answer being no, no, no. We agree to nothing. No, no, no. So that'll be fascinating to watch. If you're at home and you're trying to figure out, you know, which races should I watch? How do I figure this out? Uh, Mono and Daniela can please jump in if you disagree. The ones I start with 
and then you take the map from there, is that there are uh, seven, 16 members of Congress, nine Republicans and seven Democrats who go home to districts carried by the other guy, meaning mm -hmm. seven Democrats who go home to districts carried by Trump. If this is a Republican year, those seven should be in deep trouble, right? Uh, if this is a big Republican year, they're going home to districts that in a presidential year, when Democrat, your guy won, Joe Biden won, so turnout was up, they should be in trouble. Well, are they? Um, how many of them survive? I think one's not running for re-election, but how many, of the, how many of those districts send back Democrats? And then there are nine Republicans who go home to districts carried by Joe Biden. Again, in a traditional first-term, midterm drop-off, they should be okay, or at least better, uh, than they were when they had to fight hard in a presidential year. Are they? Uh, the Democrats think at least one, who happens to be one of that impeachment 10, uh, in California, because there's some suburban districts in California where the Democrats think they can get two or three Republicans who are in Biden districts or just Trump districts uh, because of the politics of Roe, or the politics of Dobbs and the registration. So we talk about these data points. Where's the president's approval rating? It's still historically low, but it's trending that way. Voter registration among women, trending that way. Um, so the trends right now suggest that the environment every day is getting a little bit better for the Democrats. How much better? That's why we have eight fascinating weeks ahead of us. And, and does it possibly change? Does, do gas prices start going up again instead of down? Does something happen in the world that we're not even thinking about today? So there's a lot of potential changes in the dynamic, but right now the trend lines, and for several weeks now, the trend lines have been favoring the Democrats. Republicans are trying to bend that back. We'll see if they succeed. We're almost out of time. Daniela, I wanna start with you and then Manu. Tell me one thing that you're hearing from your sources that we haven't had a chance to talk about that people out there should be looking at and looking for in the next eight weeks? Well, I'm kind of a cliche, Dana, but of course the thing that I'm paying attention to the most is where Latinos vote um, mm -hmm. as a Latina. And also from where I'm from, there's three very uh, competitive races taking place, uh, the Rio Grande Valley, where mm -hmm. uh, Republicans are pumping a ton of money into trying to uh, switch those seats. In fact, there's already a Republican. One of the seats, Mayra Flores, who's gathered a lot of attention uh, in the past couple of weeks when she uh, replaced Filamon Vela for that seat. But anyway, um, Right now, I, I mean, Latinos are not a monolith. That's a, uh, always something we say over and over again. But uh, a lot of Latinos are incredibly concerned. Recent polls have shown uh, that Roe v. Wade has become a major issue for them. Uh, and that's what uh, is dictating how they might vote in the midterms. And that is something that I'm watching and something I find very interesting, considering that is an issue that just came up, you know, since the Supreme Court ruled against Roe. And, mm -hmm. you know, usually you think Latinos are more interested in issues like the economy or opportunity, inflation. And, th and those are all issues, of course, the border. Those are all issues, immigration that they are concerned with. But most recently, that Roe v. Wade issue, uh, abortion being super major. But that's not only true of Latinos. Uh, that's true right. of everyone. But particularly with Latinos, I find that very, very interesting. Yeah. And the question is whether or not the, 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 the I wouldn't call it a trend, but the question of Latino voters uh, voting more Republican, not just in the border communities where you're from, uh, but in the interior uh, of the of the country as well. Um, Manu, last word. So, uh, even though the things, the trend and the conventional wisdom has has been that Republicans are struggling in the Senate races, there is still a serious, serious chance that they could win back the majority. And the, the Mitch McConnell still has high hopes and believes that Mehmet Oz is going to win the Pennsylvania Senate race, despite polling showing Fetterman up. Uh, there's a belief among top Republicans that perhaps Arizona will be difficult to pick up, given the performance so far of Blake Masters, the Republican candidate there. Herschel Walker has struggled on the campaign trail, but Republicans still think there's a serious chance that they could pick up that seat in Georgia. But watch out for other states that just really have not gotten nearly as much attention. New Hampshire being one of them. Maggie Hassan, she is an incumbent Democratic senator. There's a late primary this month to pick the Republican candidate against her. Republicans failed in trying to get Governor Sununu to run against her in that race. But McConnell's super PAC 
is coming in late for candidate Chuck Morse in that race. Democrats are hoping another candidate, a far-right candidate, Don Balduck, uh, will emerge from that primary. How that primary shapes up could determine whether Maggie Hassan is vulnerable. McConnell gets his pick. Perhaps that race could be very, very tight. It could also potentially flip. That would be a huge pickup for the GOP and also a potential pickup the GOP does not get as much attention. Nevada is such a key state. Catherine Cortez Masto up against a Republican candidate there who has the support of Trump and McConnell. So that there is so much to go in this in this midterm election season, even though it's just two months, even though the belief is that Republicans probably won't get back the majority, no one should should suggest that that's what's going to happen here, because a lot can happen and will happen and could turn just in the final weeks of the election. That's so true. I'll just add one other race to that. Washington State, Patty Murray, who yep. has been there for 30 years. Uh, she has a she has a race. Uh, I interviewed both she and her Republican challenger, Tiffany Smiley. Murray's taking her seriously and is raising a lot of money and is getting out there. So that could be a sleeper. We'll see how that plays out. And, Col- Thanks. and Colorado, too. And Colorado, right. too, yeah. potentially. Well, Bennett, yeah, that's another potential sleeper. A lot to keep everybody busy and everybody interested because we know the stakes are incredibly high and all of this matters for a whole host of reasons. Thank you all. Great talking to you. uh, And we'll see you soon. Thank you so much for joining us. Please follow CNN.com backslash citizen to RSVP for more talks. Have a great afternoon.